Well, happy Thanksgiving. It was yesterday to everyone. It's 12 noon in the East. That means it's another Town Hall Academy from the Remarkable Results Radio Podcast. And, you know, we, feel, we felt like we would uh, keep it light today. You know, a lot of people taking off. Shops are closed. People are at home. They're shopping. And uh, we figured we'd have a book club. Now, it may be light, but I think it's going to get heavy because there's so much to know and value and appreciate. And it's the only uh, event like this in the aftermarket live round table. And uh, glad to see you. And uh, we, we're, we'll repurpose this um, <clears throat> uh, within the week to a podcast and a video. And this is Town Hall Academy number 43, the 43rd week doing this. How cool is that? And we thank, uh, got to thank a couple of people for being here. Number one, we need to thank Joe Valland, owner of Auto Safety Center in West Bend, Wisconsin. Joe Hansen, the owner of Gordy's Garage in Roseville, Michigan. And Jude Larson, lead consultant for JML Real Solutions and director of business development with the ACT Group. Glad to have you here, guys. I know, I, trust, trust me, I know all the great things you're going to be talking about because you already sent me your lists. This is good stuff. Hey, thank you so much to Jasper Engines and Transmissions. You know, a family keeps their vehicle an average of 11 years. Where's the first place to turn when the drivetrain fails? Why, Jasper, of course. A vehicle is a major purchase, and it should be trusted to a 100% associate-owned company for quality remanufactured products. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. Hey, we're going to talk about books. I brought a few of mine down into the studio and uh, some of mine match what you guys are going to talk about. So guys, uh, you know, what I really would love to do is just to set up the basics for, you know, Joe, why should we read? Me? Yeah, yeah. which Joe? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my God. Joe one I, or Joe two? I should apologize. Joe. I'll answer. be Joe two. You can be no, Joe you'll, be, you'll be Joe Hansen. <laughs> that, that could be that too. So, uh, for, well, t why to read is because that's uh, the only way to grow, right? I mean, if we knew what we were doing, we would uh, have already done it, maybe wrote our own book, and I don't think any of us have. So, uh, you know, for me, it's just reading helps me change. It gives me a time to reflect on what I've learned and apply it. So that's the biggest reason for me. Got it. Um, I, I want to get one of your tricks on note-taking. Can you share that with us? My tricks? Yeah, on, on note taking on the books. Well, I, I listen to them. If I'm listening to them, I'll I'll sit there with my laptop and take notes at the same time. But if I'm reading it, I do the same thing. I take pictures of the pages and put them in there. So, if that's what you're referring to. Cool. Well, it kind of is, but I have a trick to share. Jude, any uh, any pointers on why reading? Um. Well, I think uh, Joe kind of put that together pretty tight. Uh, it, there's really not a lot of better other ways. And especially if you think about ROI, I mean, what does a book cost nowadays? You know, you go on Amazon or you can find a book for three bucks that could, you know, do something with free yeah. shipping, even, especially on Black Friday. Um, so, yeah, so it's it's information, you know, things that people have processed. And um, like I said before we, uh, we came on live, if you want to put yourself in the top 20% of just about anything, uh, just read a book and you're already there because um, people aren't doing it which is kind of crazy, but it is what it is. You echo that, Joe V? You bet. Um, you know, reading books, um, anything that we're not that familiar with, you know, it's a good opportunity to, to learn and, and grow our knowledge. And it's kind of that feeling of, you know, I'm not really adequate here and I need to improve and, and, uh, and learn. And books are a great way to do that. I think, you know, Jude is 100% is right. What's your ROI on on a book and I remember just getting started in reading, um, looking at used books on Amazon and spending two or three dollars and yeah, they would take two, three weeks to get there, but I mean, it's cheap. Um, and I, you know, if we wanna talk about uh, note taking, one of the tips that, that I have or I use personally for note taking is um, uh, using uh, Google Keep. I know that that's been mentioned here on the podcast before. Um, I started um, when I would read would just be writing down um, in the book, page numbers and highlighting. Well, then you got to cart all those books with you wherever you go. Um, using Google Keep, I can just take that information, put it in there. It's on my smartphone. It's on my computer at work. <clears throat> I can go back to it. Um, 
And uh, that's just been a really great way for me to, to save those nuggets and then be able to go back and, and review them. And then you sort, sort each note by, is it on leadership? Is it on you know, hiring? Is it on personal growth? And uh, that's what I do, and that's worked out pretty well for me. Thank you for that, guys. Great stuff. Appreciate this. is a good start. And let me chime in and share with you something I learned a while back on note-taking for books. And I love the, the keep. I like Evernote as far as is a great, uh, you know, repository for ideas. And I use, I use Evernote in the business. I mean, there isn't anything that I see that I don't put into Evernote. But I was never able to move into the book side with note taking. So let me show you. This is a great book. Love this book, Culture That Rocks. Um, know the author, by the way. And what I do, and just let me share this with you, is that when there is a, a page where there is anything really important, I write it down because I want to remember it. So every once in a while, I'll say, what book was that in? Oh, I think that was in Culture That Rocks, and I'll take it. And by the way, sign from the author. And I'll, and I'll go to it, and I'll say, ah, a culture test, page 28, because that's what I wrote. I just wrote culture test. So I wanted to go back and do some research on what this book gave me. Succinct page number, a couple of, couple of words, takes me right back to the page. No matter if you highlight it or not, it's awfully tough to go back and find out exactly where you are. And then I may just do a quick underline of the passage that I was looking at. So uh, something I learned from, from another author, and I can't remember who he was. Uh, from an author. Well, look at hey, thanks so much for a great preamble here. Let's uh, let's just ju jump right into it. Uh, we're each going to go. Uh, you guys are going to go back and forth on some books. I may chime in on occasion. And uh, Joe Hansen, let's start with you. What's your first book? Uh, the book that I have uh, that's really helped me a lot is called The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. Um, and the reason that uh, there's a lot of reasons I like this book, but uh, perhaps one of the biggest is that you know, he, he made his money on his own with these principles that he's teaching in the book. And I always, I always like to make sure that who I'm listening to, right. I want to make sure that they've actually done what they're writing about. It's not just talk or uh, books that are created from reading other books, but this person's actually made a huge amount of money. He has the uh, book, uh, the magazine called success. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic uh, magazine to read. It's all on successful people. Uh, but the, uh, some of the things that I've learned in the book and how I've applied them, number one is that he, he, uh, he you know, explains here there's nothing new under the sun, right? And, and that's so true because it's like how many times do we try to come up with a new creative way to run our business or a new creative way to, to do whatever it is. And really, we're just doing the same things. We're just using a different technique. But the principles are always the same. So anytime I'm trying to do something in the business, I always think to myself, am I trying to reinvent the wheel here or am I just going about it a different way? Uh, because there's no new way to invent a new principle. So I don't want to get off track. The other thing is that he's talking about in this book that I, I, that I really, really like is that he says, uh, it's not about doing 5,000 things right. It's about doing the right things 5,000 times. And that hit me because I'm trying to think, man, it, it can get so overwhelming. I know it's probably the same for you guys. It's so overwhelming to think of all the things that we do every day to run these small businesses. And we got employees, we got vendors, we got customers, we got, I mean, technology and the changes that are going on. It's just like, holy cow, I've got to focus on just a few things. So that for me, I sat down one day and I said, you know, there's, there's got to be things that I have to focus on that I have to do well, and then just put other stuff and expect other people to do what they do. So I created, it's called an executive T, exec T block I created. So I've got my five or six things that I do every single morning, actually I keep it on the wall. And I got my five or six things that I do every single morning based on every day and how long it should take me. And then I just, I knock through that every single day. And those are like the foundational things that if I do those things right, I know I'm going to maybe not have a great day, but I'll have a productive day. I'll be getting ahead if I do these things and focus on them. Um, one other uh, uh, aspect that I got out of the book is he, he's talking about that if you're, if you're not as good at something as somebody else, you just have to work three, four times harder than those other people to get it done, right? There's no excuses. It's all about personal responsibility and making it happen. So for me, I have to be really good at building a team here because I am not a mechanic. I'm not a technician. I can't go out there and produce. So if that doesn't work out there, I'm in trouble. I don't have a business. So I make sure that I, I number one, don't micromanage people because he talks about the personal responsibility. Do not micromanage 
put the put the the um, the training out there, let the people apply themselves to the training, let them do their job, and then at that point, be really good at building a good, strong culture. That's what I got uh, uh, as a real big. Um, um, I don't know what you call it. I have take to away. make that happen. Yeah, it's a takeaway, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, 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 it's a takeaway. So, you you felt personal responsibility to that piece in the book. Exactly. Thank you for that. And and so I work three times harder at building my team than than probably the next guy because a lot of the guys around me they're good they're good technicians they're great business owners but I don't I'm not I'm not a technician so I really have to go after that and make that happen. Um, and lastly, with this book that I really really like is that. We took this book and had the guys in the shop read it, right? Our advisors, and they, they went through and did a book report, if you will, like a accountability report using the book. And um, it was amazing that, you know, one of the guys hadn't read a book in, I don't know, a long time, right? And he was just telling me yesterday, because I told him I was doing this, and he said he, re- he remembers this book, and he, he remembers every week filling out his his, his uh, goals and what he was going to change because it's called a compound effect, little changes every day, create a compound effect later, right? And uh, he said there's a lot of things, not so much at work, which I noticed the things at work that he's changed, but even in his personal home life that he's changed, that this book has, has completely given him a better look in uh, how to make changes in his life. So that's probably the, one of the biggest takeaways because it's affecting these guys here, which is awesome. So, so yeah, Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. I, that's a great, great, great book. I think one of the great points that uh, Joe brought up was it's not only about the business, it's about personal. Oh, yeah. In almost every book that you can read, right? It's part of the culture, right? I mean, it's not all business here. We want to know how our guys are doing, making sure they're doing well at home, all that stuff. Well, there's nothing. There's no like we're at work here and we're that's personal life here. It it all for a good culture. I mean, we we want we're friends. We're with each other eight, 10 hours a day with them more than my family. A lot of times, right? Except my dad, he's here. <laughs> so, but but other than that, right? We want to make sure that we're 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 building everybody up. So at least giving them the opportunity great. to. Great, great, Joe. Jude, I'll let you do your first book. All right, uh, my first book is um, well, it's it's actually sort of a book. I should uh, do a miniature segue if you may indulge me for a moment. Um, uh, I use Audible a lot. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's through Amazon. Yeah, okay. So you guys all know it. Um, and it, and I love it because I can carry like you know a lot of books just you know in this thing here. I don't have to have them all with me. See, so I can show you some list there. Um, so this particular one is only actually available on on Audible that at least that I know of. And it's it's the um, the power of vulnerability uh, by. Dr. Brene Brown. She has uh, uh, stuff on YouTube. She did TED Talks. She's got lots of different books. But The Power of Vulnerability is actually um, kind of all of her books put into one. It, she says that it's the first time she's put everything together into one place. And kind of a, a funny uh, little story of how I ended up listening to this. And I think I've listened to it about seven times so far. Um, earlier this year, I was scrolling through looking for you know a good Audible choice. I just finished, I think, um, Extreme Ownership or something like that. And um, I saw the title, and uh, one of the things I've learned from reading books and doing uh, management training and, and uh, you know, trying to grow myself is that usually when you have like a almost violent emotional reaction to something, there's something there. You've hit some sort of a trigger. And so I, I read that title, and everything in me immediately went, Ugh. you know, I just thought that sounds like the most horrible thing I could ever, you know, listen to or read. And um, But I know better, uh, so... I went to my wife and said, I'm hoping I can have an out here. And I just, I just showed her and said, Hey, sweetie, what do you think about the title of that book? And she said, well, that sounds like something you should probably listen to. And I went, okay. So <laughs> a consensus so, of two. Yeah. Well, I was hoping that she would go, eh, you know, maybe, but I, and I could just like have a good go. Oh, she wasn't that interested. So I shouldn't listen to it. So, um, the, the premise of it is she's actually, uh, uh, Dr. Brene Brown is actually a, um, uh, like, like a research scientist. And so she takes um, lots of statistical data and, and formulates uh, usable information for all of us lay people. Um, at least maybe you guys aren't lay people, but I am. Anyway, so, um, so she interviews literally thousands of people. And what she was going after, which is kind of hysterical if you listen to the, um, to, to the series, um, 
she was trying to basically prove that she was what she calls wholehearted. She was a person who was living full out uh, their life. And what she really thought she was going to find is that wholehearted people are all, you know, statistical research scientists. And so she was going to be at the top of the list. And what she actually discovered was completely the opposite. And um, I, I really love her honesty in this experience that she's sharing with all of us uh, because she did something that I have, I can completely relate to as I have experienced it myself. Um, she got all this data and was, was, you know, staring at it, you know, dead in her face and, and it terrified her. And so she actually packed it all up and set it away for a year. <laughs> and she went, to uh, a, a counselor, therapist, whatever, and, and made them a list and said, here's all the things that are wrong with me. I'll give you a week for each thing. And we need to get through this process so that I can go back to doing my work. And of course, the, the counselor therapist said, well, that's not how it works. Um, so what she found was there are traits that are different between wholehearted people and people who are not wholehearted. And in this, this uh, uh, book, if you will, it's an audio book, so you're listening to it. Um, she goes through all of the challenges that she went through personally learning all of this and then she goes through kind of the 10 uh, guideposts to becoming wholehearted and, and, and uh, what they all are. I'm not going to give any spoiler alerts. You should listen to it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very powerful. Like I said, I've listened to it probably more than any other book I've ever read or listened to. Um, simply because there's so much to it. It's so robust and it, some of it is, have you guys ever read something where somebody will say something like a sentence or a, or you're reading a sentence and it literally like, uh, overloads your brain and your brain literally just kind of goes mm, like one of those computer lockup things. And you like, you close the book or you hit pause and you set it down and you go, I'm going to need about three days to think about that. And you literally can't take any new information in. You, you need to, it, it, this thing is full of those. And so um, I, I think I, when I finished reading it, I, I posted on you know Facebook because you can do a review or whatever. And I said, you know, listen to this if you are okay with completely destroying your life. Um, you know, in a good way. I mean, you yeah, know, because yeah, yeah. it's it's a good result, but it, it, you will you will not be the same at the other end of it. And you know that. A lot of the things on my list are actually of that nature, and um, I uh, I learned years ago going through some you know hard experiences that that kind of stuff is actually beneficial, even though it's not necessarily comfortable. Um, it's 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 how you're going to get to where you want to go and be able to do the things that you want to be able to do. So, anyway, good stuff. Uh, I will. Um, you've convinced me. This is a, <laughs> uh -oh. this is a must listen for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, my friend. Joe Allen. Joe, yeah. love, your, love your first book. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I guess a little bit of background on this book for me. Um, so summer of 2012, um, I got invited to attend a, a Christian businessmen's uh, group. They normally meet like uh, monthly, and it's kind of like a, a 20 group, but this is uh, men from all different industries, and this is my first experience um, going to one of these and it was in uh, north central Wisconsin so about a four and a half hour drive for me and uh, I'm thinking boy you know if I'm going to go to you know some leg with some le bit legit business owners you know maybe I need to um, you know polish up before I go and I, I happen to have um, on a audio disc, the, uh, the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. And I listened to it on my drive up for this meeting. And um, right out the gate, John goes into the number one law. There you go. Yep. Um, the number one law is the law of the lid. And in, in the 2012 was kind of a transition stage for me. Um, I had purchased the, the shop that I was operating in 2005. I had been a um, service advisor kind of running the, the, the shop. And in uh, 2012, I, I hired my first service advisor and I had a technician. So we're kind of in a, in a growth stage of, you know, I'm kind of like a real boss now. Um, and uh, just, you know, listening to the 21 laws on my drive, uh, law of the lid really jumped out at me. And basically uh, the way that John... Uh, Maxwell defines it as the law of the lid is the leadership's ability 
that determines a person's level of effectiveness. So the lower the individual's ability to lead, um, the lower the lid is on his potential. And for me, um, that just kind of hit me right at the right point in my life where I'm like, yeah, if I'm going to grow and, and continue on the, the path of growth, I'm going to need to increase my, my lid, so to speak. And the example that he gave in the book um, was the example of Ray Kroc of McDonald's. Now, um, if you've watched the movie The Founder, um, it kind of touches, touches on that a little bit. Uh, but basically, you had the two McDonald's brothers who were geniuses in customer service and kitchen organization. Um, but their lid was was low when it came to expanding the business like Ray Kroc did. Uh, Ray Kroc's lid was a lot bigger, uh, a lot taller. Um, so he was able to franchise the business, uh, grow it to, to, to what it has become today. Um, and so that was kind of his example of uh, the, the the lid and and how some people's lids are so low it really limits growth. So the the takeaway that I got from it um, was that I as a shop owner will always be the lid on my potential and I, and I must increase my lid um, if I want to continue to grow. So that would be my first book and uh, the first uh, uh, I guess uh, takeaway that I had. Great, Joe. By the way, read that book years ago. It really is a very powerful book. Both uh, I've got both the, the audio and, uh, of course, I've got the hard copy of it. Uh, thank you for that. Great, great start, guys. Appreciate that. Hey, thanks again to Jasper Engines and Transmissions. You know, when a car's engine or transmission fails, it's not the end of the road. It remanufactured drivetrain product for your customer's car from Jasper Engines and Transmissions will give your customer's car, a new lease on life. Thanks, Jasper Engines and Transmissions, for supporting this Town Hall Academy. Joe, you're up. Your second book. All right. So <clears throat> I just want to allude to what you guys are saying about Audible and then also having the paper copy. Sometimes, this is not to do with my second book, but sometimes, like, for me, I don't know what it is, but if I listen to the Audible version first and then I take the book out and read it, for some reason, and I don't know why, I seem to comprehend the book when I can hear that author's voice, which is so weird because I'll, I'll just sit there and read it and I'll hear, you know, the, like I'm reading one called The Story Brand right now. It's an awesome marketing book. And, uh, and I can hear the author as I'm reading it because I've already listened to it twice uh, in my car. So I'm like, oh, this, is, this makes it easier to understand it. So I don't know if, that, if you guys ever do that, but it, uh, it, will, it reminds me of the book or the movie it, <laughs> in concept, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what do you like to do? Read the book first, then see the movie or see the movie, then read the right. book. Right. I guess it's your own personal preference, but yeah. Great point. Thank you. Yeah. Me. But it, it helps. And it helps me with taking my notes too. Cause you, when you asked the first question, I was kind of like, yeah, well, but, but, uh, note taking tricks. I'm like, I, I don't know. I, cause what I do is I just take the book and read it, but I type it into, instead of keep, I use Google docs. So then I've got all of them in there and yeah. then I can yeah. pull them up on my phone. So, yeah. but the second book that I, uh, um, really, really enjoyed. And my wife talk, my wife and I talk about this all the time because about, I think it was 10 or 12 years ago, we learned about the personality profiles and everybody, you know, this is almost like over talked about, but uh, the reason it probably is, is because it's so important, we think. So we read uh, a book called The Personality. There's a bunch of these, but this was one that we read a long time ago called Personality Plus. And it's how to understand others by understanding yourself. And, you know, so, so there's so many examples that we could use with this. But for, for my wife and I, we just think, man, I don't know how the heck we'd even be married if we didn't know this information because we're complete polar opposites. I'm a D type or A type, depending on which book you read, right? And she's a complete S. So we're, we're completely opposite. So like when we talk, we're like, if there's any, uh, any friction or conflict, her tendency is to close down and be quiet and be stubborn. And my tendency is, is like, let's fight, right? Like verbally, not, not fight, but you know, let's, let's, let's talk this thing out. And so, you know, to someone like me, I look at her and go, what, why the heck is she shutting down? Why is she quiet? There's nothing more annoying to somebody that wants to, you know, get something figured out is for the other person to be quiet about it. And then they're not responding. You just want to, and, and ironically, my dad is an S too. So, you know, if we have a discussion in the shop, right? I'm like, hey, let's let's do this. He's like, it'll be fine. Just it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I'm like, it won't be fine. We got to get this figured out now. So, you know, knowing this though now, knowing this information, it's like, well, that's just how they are. The S is someone who's very cautious, quiet. They don't like conflict. The D is someone who likes to 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 be uh, 
I guess, push the limit, if you will, and bold and daring and, 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 and going all the time. Well, those two, if you don't know that about each other, it's, it's going to be complete tension. And you're, and you're going to think your, your spouse doesn't like you or you don't like your spouse. It's just going to be fighting. But knowing that, like now, I know that if my wife, you know, if there's something that's a conflict and she's a little bit quiet, I just know to let it be. You know, let her work it out and then she'll talk. And she knows the same with me. And she knows if she brings something up, I'm going to want to, let's f- figure this out right now. So she knows that about me too. So we, we just look and we go, man, we don't, we absolutely don't know how we'd be married happily without knowing this information. And then when are you going to say something, Carl? I will in a minute. Okay. And then when we translate that into the, into the shop, right? So I, I said that I'm real big on culture. So what we do is we give everybody a personality test when they first start here. And we can see what they are. There's no right or wrong. I'm not looking for any type of personality, right, per se. But I'm just looking to see what they are. Because the person with the information, so if I know the personality types, it's my responsibility to use that to communicate effectively with the other people. And by no means, according to the book and according from just having it, uh, uh, but, you know, running the business is that by no means is anybody's personality an excuse of why they cannot do something. So if somebody is a C type, a detail type, and we ask them to go talk to a customer and smile, that doesn't mean that they can't do that because they're a C type, right? Or an S, it doesn't mean they can't go talk to customers or a D. It doesn't matter. As long as we know what it is, we have to use that information to communicate uh, more effectively with our coworkers or our, our customers. So, Right now, like in our shop, uh, the, the guys that are here, I am the only high D in the shop. Everybody else is very high I, which is, that's the type of person that wants to have a party and everything's fun and, la- and, and laugh and all that stuff, which I have that too, but my natural tendency is a D. So I have to tell myself, well, and S, that's their second one. So it's like they're all the same. It's very weird. They're S's and C, and uh, it's just crazy. I and S's. Yeah, I's and S's, and I'm, uh, and, um, I don't have any S. I'm trying, but I don't. So I have to tell myself that when I'm about to go out there and have a meeting or go out there and confront something, that I want people to work here when I'm done. So I have to take a breath and go, okay, how am I going to say this? How am I going to approach this so that I don't, you know, just blow people out of the out of the business, if you will. Good stuff. Good stuff, Joe. So, I want to stop you there for one minute. And, and here's the reason. Two weeks ago, we were here on an academy. And our topic was the value of knowing your customer's observable behavior. And we talked all about DISC, D-I-S-C, okay. which is exactly what Joe uh, is chatting about. And you, your, your, your point is so well taken about the interplay inside the, the company, in the team, and in family. Because yeah. when I found out mine, it sure helped me in, in, in my personal relationships. And there is uh, so much value in being able to, Determine what your customer who just walked in the door or customer that you've had for life, what their observable behaviors are because you never want to have your discussion with them. You want to have their discussion with them based on their, if you will, as you said, personality type. So I want to encourage everyone because Joe was talking about DIS and C and people are they're scratching their head. What the heck is that? That's to get them to read the book. That's why I didn't explain. No, it. <laughs> uh, I, I'm with you, but, but uh, I'll just obviously, cause I'm in sales too. I'll promote the episode. <laughs> go oh, to yeah. the town hall. Go, yeah. Go to the website, Town Hall Academy episode 41. And in that are a couple of really cool links to uh, literally w- one free one to do your own D I S C from Tony Robbins. Uh, the link is in that. And also, so I created this really cool chart as to how to sell someone, depending on what your personality trait is. And if, I, if I'm if i an I, how do I sell to a D? And it's, it's really a cool chart and it's available to be downloaded. So thank you for that. We were able to link that to a, an academy we did just did two, two weeks ago. Good stuff, guys. I'm loving this. Oof. And by the way, so that everyone knows, in the show notes, We'll have every one of these books, even the ones that we did, I mean, we, we, we may not get to yet today because there's a ton of them here for everyone. And we'll have them all listed in case anyone wants to go back. Jude, your second most important book. Well, I don't know if it's second most important, but it's second on the list. So all we'll right. go for it. Um, sure. By the way, it may have been a rumor, but I heard because we we're doing book club that Oprah was going to drop by later. Is that true? She is. Yes. Okay. Um, cool. She's in the green room. 
Excellent. Excellent. Um, so uh, one other note about Audible, too. I'm going to give away a, a free uh, trick here. Um, if you go into your, your Audible thing, and I believe you can even do this on the Remarkable Results uh, app, um, you, when you're playing uh, something, you can actually change the speed of it. So I can listen to, if you will, a six-hour book in four hours. Now, you can adjust that speed up or down depending on what you're comfortable with because obviously you don't want to go so fast you're not retaining anything. Um, but you can actually get through more books faster if you uh, do that. And I do that a lot when I'm traveling and, or you know driving or whatever. So that's just one of the tricks that I learned that helps me to uh, get as much information. And then, um, well, I can just say, and like Joe said, because you won't know which one I'm talking about, um, uh, you, you can... Uh, you know, get that information, you can um, use it, apply it, and uh, keep going with it. So anyway, so book number two uh, that I was talking about is actually by a gentleman named uh, Brian Clemmer. Um, he passed away a few years ago. Actually, I was uh, about to go meet him, uh, and three days before I, I met, had a chance, chance to meet him, he uh, passed away suddenly, so that was kind of sad. But he wrote it. It's a short book, but it's called uh, If How-Tos Are Enough, We'd All Be Skinny, Rich, and Happy. And um, this book probably is one of the big initial impacting books on me when I kind of started really making some big changes in um, the way I was looking at life and what I was doing. And what it talks about is um, mindsets or programs or there, there's a million different names. He, he refers to them in sunglasses. Um, just the way you look at things in life and um, uh, getting kind of stuck or hung up in those old habits and the way we see things. Um, the example he uses is if you're born wearing a, a certain color of sunglasses, um, you, you've had them your entire life. You don't know any, you don't even know that you're wearing them. Uh, if, if you, if you look at someone wearing uh, a white shirt, for example, and you're wearing green sunglasses to you, that shirt will be green. Um, everyone else may notice that it's actually white. You could even get into arguments with people. And you're saying no, it's green. They're saying no, it's white. You're going back and forth. Um, they can they can yell at you. They can tell you every day. They can they can do whatever they want. But as long as you're still wearing those green sunglasses, you're never going to be able to see that that shirt is white. And so it's it it talks about how do we become uh, detectives, kind of in our own world, and uh, find where we have these programs running. Um, you know, because if you get into the details of it. Uh, it's actually, you know, uh, brain science, the neural pathways that run from, you know, stimulus response, that kind of thing. Um, those get programmed in, uh, like hardwired. They can they can actually see them now inside the brain. We have so much uh, advanced technology. And when those are running, we don't even necessarily know that they are. They estimate we have some 1,500 words a minute running through our brain, and we're only aware of maybe 10% of them, and I think that's being pretty generous. Um, so then it's, what are the what's the other 90 percent of the words that are running through my head saying and doing um and if you you know some of it is good stuff like you know like you get in your car at night and you drive home and you wake up kind of in the driveway right you're just like oh i'm home and you don't even remember the drive so some of the some of the words that were going through were you know stop sign you know yield you know merge left that kind of stuff and so your subconscious is driving the car home basically um and you ever had that moment where somebody cuts in front of you and suddenly you're like, whoa, you know, and you're like, oh, that's right, I'm driving a car. You know, and that's, that's uh, how kind of our brain works. So anyway, so when you have other programs that are running in there, though, um, not just the drive the car home at night program, but a program that maybe somebody, you know, uh, impressionable in your youth told you that you weren't good enough, told you, I mean, there's all sorts of things um, that could happen. Uh, you know, for example, somebody could say something to you when you're young enough and it becomes a, a habit or a pattern or a program or sunglasses that like, you know, that's why when I read the title of the first book that I talked about, the power of vulnerability, the word vulnerability, I wasn't worried about the word power or the or of, it was the word vulnerability that made me have a, a violent internal reaction of, of, oh, that does not sound like something I want to, you know, get involved in. Um, so that to me, that's why I said I knew the difference was because of the, the study of this book is I knew that because I was having that little physical reaction that I needed to do something about it. And so I went for, you know, I went for backup and, and uh, asked my wife, which worked out well. Um, 
So it's, it's, it's all about figuring out how to recognize when we run into one of those patterns. And we've done the same thing over and over and over again, and we're in the same place, and we don't like that place. That place isn't serving. We have the goals we've written down. We have all the, those things in front of us, and yet we still don't have it. There's still some sort of a blockade. Well, doing, doing the work, the internal work, which it's hard work. Um, it's the best ROI you'll ever get. Um, I think it was Warren Buffett that said that, that the best ROI you'll ever get is working on yourself um, because our capacity and our abilities are far beyond any, you know, think any tool you can buy. Um, anyway, so if you work on that stuff, that's how you really, really make huge changes in your life to where you can get past the things that are kind of hanging you up. And um, there's just all sorts of stories of people going through stuff like that. And whether it's a business thing or relationship or any other aspect of life, um, it makes a huge difference when you can recognize those things. And I've, I've written classes around this subject and, and, um, and, and help people through that experience, you know, live in front of a group, which is, I'm, I'm more blown away, I think, than anybody in the class when it's happening, because I'm standing in the front going, wow, this is like real right now. And how am I the guy who's up here facilitating this, you know, because I feel like I should be in the audience nodding my head along with everybody else. So, so that's the number book number two for me. I love I love what you just said. You helped you t you took the book and and created some seminars to help facilitate change. Mm -hmm. Cool, good yeah, for it's, you. It's important stuff. Yep. Joel Valen, number two. All right, um, my number two book is Entree Leadership. Dave Ramsey. Let's see it. Yep, there you go. Look at that. Spit an image. This is a great. Great. Oh book. man, this 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 is definitely one of those big impactful books for my business and my career. Oh yeah, um, this is an early read that I had when I was still marking up my book with highlighters and red pens, and um, I I don't really have a whole lot of the notes in this book on my Google <laughs> Keep, but uh, um, nonetheless, this book it was kind of hard to pick one topic. Um, that, that meant the most to me. Um, one of the, the takeaways from here is budgeting, um, debt, um, coming up with pay plans. Um, this is a great book for pay plans. Um, but I think really what it boiled down as I was thinking about um, what had the biggest impact on me was in the book he says, don't confuse having a position with leadership. So having children doesn't make you a good parent. It only means you had sex and that's it. Um, so as a, when I bought my shop, um, I was immediately the boss, um, and boss is a position. It's not necessarily a, a leader. And so the book kind of walked me through, you know, the difference between a boss and a leader. Um, and, uh, obviously I want to grow my leadership skills. And, um, so the book was valuable for that. So one of the, the distinctions that it makes is that, uh, bosses have employees and leaders have teammates. Um, so I like to refer to my um, people that work for me as teammates because they are important to the success of our business and uh, their input is valuable. They see things um, with a different uh, colored lens, I guess, than I see things. Um, so it would be wise of me to, to, to listen and, and see where they're coming from. Um, another thing in the book that it talked about um, that, I, that I got a lot from was the leader's ability to um, get change happening in an organization. Um, so as a boss, they would just come in and they would just order around and say, you do this, you do this, you do this. And, and using that, that authority um, to try to inspire change where a, a leader um, is going to use the power of persuasion. Um, he's going to get everybody lined up and say, this is the direction we're going and this is why. Um, and in the book, um, they, they use a term like, um, uh, pulling the rope. A leader pulls the rope, a boss pushes the rope. Obviously, if you're pulling a rope, it works a lot better than trying to push, uh, push a rope. Um, and you pull the rope by explaining the why behind what you do. So I guess the way that that can flesh out for me um, as a shop owner is I need to take the time to explain the why behind a change that we're trying to make. So an example would be, why do we need to ask every client for an email address? Why do we need to do that? 
or why do we need to ask every new client that comes in or maybe even calls us on the phone, how did you find out about us? Well, the answer for that question is pretty easy because we're spending money on marketing and we want to be able to determine what's giving us a return on that, those marketing dollars. Um, when you start explaining it that way, they can say, oh yeah, well that kind of makes sense. Um, you know, why do we do a digital vehicle inspection and, and um, why, you know, why is the most important part? So um, that would be my number two book would be Entree Leadership. It's a wealth of information. I just touched on one of the parts that spoke the most to me, but uh, if you're going to get one book, get that one. I agree with you, Joe. Thank you so much. Uh, this was a, 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 I couldn't put it down book and I'll share with you. I never always read the book from beginning to end. Sometimes I don't. And yeah, I think we're all going to sit here and say, okay, Carm, thanks for being vulnerable and, and telling us. <laughs> and, and, and so let me tell you, this was one of those beginning to ends. We just talked about personality traits. We just talked about DISC. He talks about it in this book, by the way. Okay. So <clears throat> I was so curious to, to know that, you know, I, I get three quarters through, the, through a book and I get a little bored with it. It's just the essence I got I already got. And I, it, you start getting into that last three quarters of the book and you say, hmm, it's getting a little boring or raw. And, and I was wondering if it was just me and maybe I didn't have the patience or <laughs> the ability to, you know, see that last page go over. So <laughs> when I did an interview with Tom Ziegler, of course, Zig Ziegler's son who runs the Ziegler Corp and Barry Barrett, episode 220, I asked him as an author and, you know, uh, the, the head of Ziegler about what he's reading. He's sitting at his couch at home and he's got all these books next to him. And I said, well, how do you do this? It's, it's in the episode. You have to hear it. And he goes, I'm at different stages of every book, depending on when I get up in the morning, what I really want to complete and what was interesting to me, what's going on in my world. I may take a book and, and consume it for three or four days and then put it down again. I said, do you read them all? He goes, no. And I, I was almost felt relieved to find out. True that here, confessions. Yeah, here's an author who's telling me that, no, he sometimes doesn't get through them all because he just got out of the book what, what, he, what he needed. So <laughs> I had, had to put that on record, everyone. Hey, this is going great. I appreciate the great detail, and, and I'm sure our audience is going to um, just, just love what we're doing. Joe, another book? Joe Hansen? Yeah. So the third book that I had written down <clears throat> was the, uh, the greatest miracle in the world by Og Mandino. And I think this is probably one of a less popular book nowadays, but I, uh, there was a guy that I still know, but f probably about five or six years back, he had said that his favorite, and he's very successful, not just financially, but, uh, his family is. So I was like, you know, that, I look up to him. So he said his favorite book in the world was this book, the greatest miracle in the world. And I thought, Oh, okay, that, that'd be pretty cool. It sounds, sounds pretty exciting. And I started reading it and I honestly, it's like, gosh, this book is weird. You know, it doesn't, you know, it's like a story and I don't like, I don't like storybooks. I like, you know, just give me how to apply this stuff. Give me factual, you know, I'm not into like, you know, the, like a Mary what, had a little lamb, right? Yeah. I'm not, that's not my thing, but, but I finished the book, right? And uh, it turns out it's probably my, it's probably the most important book that I ever read because, you know, the greatest miracle in the world, obviously, you know who that is. It's, it's you, right? And uh, it, when you get to the end of the book, there's a memorandum in there and it, 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 and it's from God, right? And so when you, you know, with that same guy that recommended the book, he said, you always got to remember that if you build the, the person, they can go build a business, but you can't have a person that's not, wholesome or a person that has figured themselves out, they, they, they're not capable of long-term success because they'll, they'll fail somewhere along the line, whether it's, uh, whether it's, they'll make uh, moral decision mistakes or financial mistakes. They're going to make big, big mistakes. Not that we're not going to anyway, but you, you, he said, you just have such a bigger chance with, uh, and this isn't the author I'm talking about, the person who recommended this. It's just, you, you just gotta, you gotta build yourself up first in order to properly build up your, uh, your business. Um, and so in the book, you know, it's talking about, um, well, we'll stepping back a little bit. Sometimes when you're, when we're in business or just life in general, 
you just start wondering, can, can I do this? Is it possible? I, am I capable? Of, am, am, do I deserve that? Is it, you know, am, do I have the skill set to, to learn in order to be successful, to take care of my family, to take care of my, you know, my teammates at, at the shop to, to just succeed, right? You start doubting yourself. Well, and then when you read this book and you're like, well, how can that be that I could, how, that I could fail? How could it be that I, uh, I'm not capable because I, I was created by, right, by God. So this will be weird to some people. So that's why I'm saying this. And, uh, and so when, when you look in there and you're reading this book and it says that, uh, uh, you know, there's 23 chromosomes in your body, hundreds of thousands of, uh, or hundred or thousands of genes within each and, you know, he could have created 300,000 billion human beings, but he created you, right? So when you read this and you're like, yeah, that, that's crazy. That's, that's, that's a miracle, right? And then you start thinking of, the, uh, of, of what, you know, are we capable of running an auto repair business? Are you kidding me? Of course I am. I mean, look at that. How could I not, right? And then when you start saying, uh, to start, start doubting yourself. And I started realizing for me to doubt, right. Of what I'm capable of doing in the, in the, in with my family or the shop, that's almost unfaithful, right? Because I was just told that I can do it and I was created for something huge. So that's helped me to not, uh, to do a couple things that I wrote down, not to compare myself to others. Right. I still do it, but I, I try not to, right. Cause when I compare myself to somebody else that might be uh, succeeding faster than I want to. And in a certain area, then I'm likely to, to make hasty decisions and, and try to take shortcuts and, and, uh, be tempted, right. By, you know, uh, the, the wrong, wrong thing. So, so not comparing myself helps, helps me there. And then, uh, 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 the other is to, to not doubt the principles that work, right. Because the principles are created and I was created to follow those principles to not doubt the, the principle, stay the course and, and just do what I know I should be doing. Right. So do that. And what does that mean? That means, that means that even when something could be easy to not do truthfully, like at a shop to do it the right way, no matter what, just do it and just go on faith that it's the right way. So those are just a few things that I, I got out of that book. But the biggest thing is, is, that we have to, for me, I realize I have to work on myself and I have to, when I get uh, stressed or I get overwhelmed, I have to take a step back and go, you know what? I got this. I can handle this. I was created for this. This is possible. And it tells me so right here. So I just got to go back and read that and uh, believe that. So, and again, that might sound a little odd or a little different to some people, but man, you know, you got to ask yourself. It, does, it you, makes a lot of sense, yeah. Joe, and it works for you. And that's all that matters. Right. Really. Right. That's all that matters. So Good get stuff. the book Thank and you. read it, even if you don't like storybooks. <laughs> get the book. It's now. a storybook. <laughs> it's a storybook. Get it now. Hey, Jasper has over 2,000 associates, three manufacturing facilities. In fact, I've been in one. Unbelievable company. Two distribution centers and 45 branch offices around the country. They're all working to produce, transport, and deliver the perfect product. That's what they do best. Keep customers happy. Uh, wow, it's, this is going great. I love it. Hopefully we can change people's minds that we have to, we have to, um, uh, what, what's, hang on, if I can find that great quote that I wrote earlier. I don't think I did. Ah, here it is. Not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. From Harry S. Truman. Jude, and then Joe, we're going to end up the, uh, the academy. We'll do Jude and then Joe. Jude, give me your next book. All right. Well, I'm going to actually skip down a couple because uh, I'm going to leave one for Joe that I see is on his list. I don't want to steal them. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, first, I got to touch on Joe's. Uh, I got to buy that book now. That was just an amazing. I mean, there's actually several on here now that I'm like, going, oh, I don't have that one. And several that I do, obviously. But um, but yeah, there's that's that sounds like a great book. So I'll be getting that. Um, so the one I want to talk about next is um, it's it's called Leadership and Self Deception. And it's by the Arbinger Institute. It is also a story. Sorry, Joe, but um, but 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 it's an interesting story in that it follows uh, the life of a gentleman who has been hired onto a new company, uh, executive level, and kind of the, the the mindsets that he brought with him. And this company has a very specific culture that they've built. 
and they spend a couple of days, they actually pull him out of production, out of the stuff that he normally is doing, getting done, um, you know, trying to prove himself in those, those first, you know, 30 days or whatever. And they spend an entire couple of days, uh, the leadership of this company, um, going over these principles with him. And so I'll, I'll, I'll summarize, but you really, you really do need to read the book. It's one that I work with um, my clients and, and all of my team at my shop. Um, we've gone through this. And so everybody will use a phrase like, oh, he's in the box or are you in the box or I'm in the box or that kind of thing. And what that means is um, uh, self-deception means that it, it comes when we do something that we don't believe we should be doing. So we have a thought. Um, I'll just use an example from the book. You're, you get on an airplane. Maybe you guys have experienced this. I know I have. I will be vulnerable, and I will admit that. Um, you, you sit down in your seat, right? And some of them, they don't have the reserve seating. It's like, you, you know, it's the cattle car. You're just kind of fighting for whatever seats are open, right? So you sit down, and there's an open seat next to you, and people are coming down the aisle, and you just – one of those days where you just don't feel like having a conversation, right? You just want to sit, and you just want to, like, either you want to read or you want to nap or whatever it is. But what you don't want to do is have a conversation and fight, you know, elbows for the, the – the armrest, right? So what do we do? And the guy and telling the story it explains the exact same thing. We, you know, if I'll admit I've done it, I'm sure you guys haven't, you're probably much nicer than I am, but <laughs> you make yourself, you make yourself really big, right? You just kind of like lean over a bit. You don't make eye contact with anybody coming by in the aisle. You're just like this. And you know, you put your briefcase there maybe, or you got your newspaper open, you know, so you're doing whatever you can to make it obvious that it's going to be uncomfortable for them to try to invade your space that you've just claimed, right? It's like animal kingdom stuff going on. So the, the, the example they give is, is in that scenario, um, we've done a few things. We, we know that as a human being, if we were looking at those people walking by as other human beings, we would just see them as people who need to sit down because they're trying to get to somewhere. Same as us, right? But what instead, when we go into the box, as they talk about, we're now looking at them as objects, right? They are something that is between me and my comfort. And it's really easy to dismiss an object. And what we'll often do that where the self-deception part comes in is we'll start um, convincing ourselves of all of the terrible things about them and all of the wonderful things about us. Like, I worked really hard this week. I deserve to have an open seat next to me. I, you know, and, and that guy obviously hasn't worked a day in his life. I mean, look at him, right, as he's walking by, right? So we're making all these judgment calls, uh, turning them into monsters and us into saints, right? And so that we can justify our actions that we know we're self-deceiving ourselves. We know they're not the right actions. And so they, <clears throat> excuse me, shares an experience of, 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 of doing something like that and saying, you know, they, to me, they were objects. They were just worthless objects moving past. And then he shares another example where he gets on a plane with his wife, and they're the last ones on the plane, which I've done that as well uh, with my wife. And um, and so uh, talk about different personalities, right? So anyway, so um, so the getting on a plane. There's no two seats left next to each other. There's one in the back and one in the front. The wife is really nervous about flying. She doesn't want to sit by herself. And so, you know, they're in a situation where they're trying to figure out what to do. Well, there's a flight attendant who's working with them, trying to figure out, you know, and this gal who's way in the back, she comes up and she goes, hey, I noticed that the two of you are trying to find seats together. There's one next to me. I'd be happy to sit up in your seat if you guys want to come back and, and take these two seats back there. And so they, he's given this contrast of in that instance, that woman saw them as two people who were looking for seats next to each other. She didn't see them as an object or as, you know, some sort of a, a, a negative thing or somebody who was trying to take something from them. She just treated them as two people who were looking for a seat just like she was. She just needed to fly somewhere, you know. And so there's a, there's a difference uh, if we go through life looking at people as objects uh, as opposed to looking them at at them as people and this goes into a thorough study of that and why we do it and and um, I know uh, in the car and traffic that's a really popular place for me to look at people as objects um, uh, they may be acting like objects I think you know at that point but, but uh, anyway so uh, it, it's a very powerful book I do like I said a study of it with um, uh, all of my clients it's one of the, the required reading because it it helps shift the culture inside of a business to um, be thinking as each other as other human beings, uh, fellow human beings, rather than as an object. Um, anyway, so that is my 
final book. <laughs> Thank you, Jude. Good stuff. Love it. Love the analogy from, from the book. Uh, and our last book of the day, and I uh, wish we could go on for hours here because you guys, uh, we, we've left a lot on the table, but I'll be sure to include them in the show notes for this episode. Joe, Valen? All right. Um, so the, uh, the next book for me would be Extreme Ownership, How U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win. Um, and I got this version right here on Audible. So, yeah. Good, good. Um, the, I, I didn't buy this book, um, paper copy, just Audible. Um, and I tell you, um, if you want to listen to a riveting book uh, th on Audible, this would be the one. Um, it, it will hold you tight to the seat, and uh, it's exciting. They, they, they weave in uh, war stories with stories of their company um, going through corporate America and, and teaching leadership. Um, but one of, the, one of the takeaways from this book um, and there's multiple, but I guess if I had to pick one would be when, when setting an expectation, no matter what has been said or writ written, if substandard performance is accepted and no one's held accountable, that substandard performance becomes a new standard. So it's not necessarily what you say. It's not what you write. Um, it's what you allow. What and you tolerate, yeah. Yes, what, what, what you tolerate, absolutely. Um, and so for me as a shop owner, I need to be intentional about what I allow and what I tolerate um, and make sure that, uh, you know, I may say in my employee handbook, you know, this is, you know, you're supposed to be here on time, but, you know, what, what happens when, you know, when employee comes in late 15 minutes, you know, um, four or five times a month, you know? Um, it, it's, it's what you tolerate. Um, it's, a, it's a really good book. It's read on the audible version by the, by the authors. Um, and they have that riveting Navy SEAL voice that, uh, that will, will, will just in, invoke fear in your heart. And you're like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so it's, it's a great book. I would strongly recommend it. Um, it's a great listen, and I'm assuming it's a great read, too. I, uh, I, I love this book uh, my, myself. It, it, it take the ultimate responsibility uh, of, of your actions, and uh, great examples of how people were shirking their responsibilities and blaming others for ultimately something that lands uh, on your shoulders and in your lap. And, uh, and, and that, you know, and, and it's okay. The book says, hey, it's, it's okay to accept full responsibility and get it done. It's okay to tell someone, I goofed. It was something I learned a long time ago is to admit that you're really human and you're vulnerable <laughs> and that you actually did make a mistake. Usually the recovery for that mentally on your part and with your client, your customer, your friend is a lot easier by accepting extreme ownership. Good stuff. Thank you. Hey, uh, guys, uh, I wish we could go on and, and catch the other eight or nine books that you have in your lists, but we've kind of pretty much used an hour on Black Friday here at the Town Hall Academy. So uh, my, my warm thanks to you for these great lists. I, I, I'm hoping that our listener from not only today on Facebook and in the future as the podcast gets released will really change some people's lives and, and make them better uh, readers and realize that there's an awful lot of good stuff out there that will change our world if we let it.